All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 7. I can't imagine you not having your Bible in this church because we are a Bible church. Amen? And I uh, want to find out how many of you are coming Tuesday night so we can thaw out the steaks, I mean, thaw out the uh, juice and uh, break the bread. Uh, really, I was asking what would be the estimated number of being here. And so I'm going to find out right now. Um, all of you that are coming, come up here and sign this list. No, if all of you that's coming, raise your hand if you're going to be here at 5 o'clock Tuesday. Okay, looks like about 70, amen, or so, amen, so well, I think we'll be safe with that number, Brother Al. I got a poem that I want to read uh, by Miss Elsie Hobbs at the end of the service that she wrote, and she gave me a whole collection of, of psalms, of poems before she Passed on to glory. I preached her funeral at Cleveland, Ohio. Wonderful funeral. She preached her own funeral. She was a dear saint of God, and I miss her so much. And she was a praying saint of God. She adopted uh, my children as her grandchildren and adopted many of your children as her grandchildren and adopted many of you as her children. And so uh, she was really a blessing, and I miss her so much. And I just uh, discovered a book in my office, and it was a book of, of poems, and it goes along with my message, and I pray I won't forget to read that. All right, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. How many of you tired of shopping? Raise your hand. Tired of shopping? Okay. How many shopped all day? Don't raise your hand. Um, it's uh, good that Christmas is almost here, isn't it? isn't it? Amen. And don't stress out. Don't panic. I preached on the joy of Christmas giving uh, this, this morning. If ever I'm glad that God changed the message, I'm glad He changed it because I was going to preach this this morning and I just think that um, that message is what I needed and I really got a blessing out of it. Sometimes you get a blessing out of your own preaching and that's all right, amen? If you don't get a blessing out of your own preaching, you won't preach long because you got to hear a lot of it, amen? But that was a good play in, wasn't it? I know the teacher was very excited, Miss Rebecca, somebody's asking uh, about taking lessons during handshaking time. See her, I can't give you any lessons. Uh, but um, uh, that's a proud teacher, and I know it's proud parents. And I want to tell you something. Uh, what they do for Christ is a lot more important than what they do for the world. Amen? And so encourage them. Encourage them. Amen? Because they'll continue to have a big heart to do things for God. Isaiah chapter 7, I'll read one verse. I know you all getting spoiled just reading one verse, so we'll be going to uh, Joshua in a couple of weeks. I'll read a whole chapter at a time, so you can stand up a long time. But I'm just going to read one verse. Let's stand on to the Word of God, though, because we want to pledge allegiance to His Word. Amen? It says, Therefore the Lord Himself, verse 14, chapter 7, Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. <clears throat> Behold, a virgin shall conceive. That's a miracle. And bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel and shall call his name Emmanuel. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for the good song, sirs. I'm glad I did miss this service. And I'm glad, Lord, that young people want to do something for God. I know they were very nervous. Uh, but, Lord, did a good job. We thank you for them. Thank you for the parents directing them and encouraging them. Lord, we thank you, dear God, for uh, people that use their talents, their time, <clears throat> their treasures for God. <clears throat> Lord, I want to thank you as I did in the prayer room for a peaceful, united, loving church. Lord, there's nothing like it to have a church that's together, that loves each other and encourages each other. What an atmosphere of love. But God, more than an atmosphere, what an opportunity to worship you together at your foot. And God, at your <clears throat> feet we can bow as one united family and praise your name for all your goodness and all that you mean to us, and all that we mean to each other. So Lord, keep our church close, and keep our fellowship sweet. And God, we rebuke anybody that would try to divide it. And Lord, we pray that you'd use this message now to encourage hearts, to encourage other hearts from this message. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Christmas should be the most joyful, <clears throat> excuse me, glorious, Happy time of the year. Can somebody say amen? 
It ought to be. But some, to some, it's the loneliest, most depressing time of the year. And I want to preach on that tonight. How you can, God's answer to loneliness. God's answer to loneliness. Now why is it? Well, for those who are lonely, they're probably already lonely, and they look around and everybody's laughing, everybody has family, everybody has a husband or a wife. I'm glad I'm married, praise God. Amen. Amen. My wife's really glad she's married, but no, and uh, they have hugging and fellowship, uh, singing and smiling, and uh, it just reinforces the emptiness that's already in their life. So I don't think Christmas brings on loneliness. I think it just identifies it and amplifies it. No wonder Christmas time is the leading time for suicide. No wonder Christmas is the leading time for drunkenness. Can you imagine going out and get drunk to celebrate the birth of Christ? Some of you did that when you were stupid. I mean, when you were lost. Amen? You were lost. You did that. And you partied on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve. And folks, no wonder people are depressed. And in January, the psychiatrist cannot even take a day off because everybody's depressed because Christmas has come and they're empty. Our text is 700 years old. Christ is going to be born a virgin, conceived, and, he's, and the virgin is going to bear a son. And there's the explicit detailed instruction of what to call him, Emmanuel. And the word Emmanuel means God with us. So I want to preach just a few minutes on the cure for loneliness, Emmanuel. Number one, loneliness is a fact of human existence. What is loneliness? Well, Number one, it's not solitude. Christ, uh, Jesus often withdrew himself. We ought to often withdraw ourselves. Amen? Sometimes after everybody clears out and there's nobody but you, you smile. <laughs> Amen. You're excited for the quietness of the hour. Uh, night, I see it was last night, or night before last, I had all of... Uh, the Cofield's up, Stephen and his family. And I have one set of keys, one set, cost me $250 if I get another set, so I'm trying to get one. And uh, we lost my keys. I didn't lose them, somebody else lost them. And uh, we searched and we searched. You ever done that? I mean, we got in a panic and I mean, we were, I had a flashlight out and I was under every bed and I said, I guarantee you that, Oliver, he took my keys. I just know he took my keys. Let's integrate him, amen, before he leaves. And, and uh, we searched and searched. And finally we passed the couch and little Lexi's laying down there with a hand behind her head and says, Papa, I took your keys. <laughs> I said, you did what? She said, I took your keys. He said, and I put it in a little purse of mine. And I think I put that purse on your desk. And I just want to let you know I took your keys. We ran in there. His, her mother ran in there real quick and opened up a little old purse and there they were. I'd have never found them if she hadn't had that confession. Amen? Then afterwards, I looked at her and said, Honey, don't take my keys anymore. He says, she, she looked at me real calm, calmer than she was before she announced where the keys were and says, I'm going to get my own keys. <laughs> and so, and so, so, you know, after they all left, there was solitude. Amen? Uh, let me just say this. I don't believe that Psalms 23 would have ever been written today. You know why? Too much Facebook, too much uh, telephones, too much texting. No, nobody can ever stand still and know that he is God and meditate. So folks, loneliness is not solitude. Sometimes solitude is just good. Just pray. Jesus often withdrew himself. And then um, loneliness is not Lonesomeness. There's a difference in lonesomeness and so loneliness. Uh, you can be lonesome for home. Uh, you can be out of town and out of country and be lonesome. 
I like that song, I'll be home for Christmas, even if it is a dream. At least you have a, a, a home. But at least you know that there's somebody who loves you, who cares for you, who considers you. That's being lonesome for that place. I guarantee you the hardest time for a missionary is around Christmas. Uh, my my uh, daughter will not usually call home. She'll text home because she'll start crying because she misses mama so much. And she probably misses daddy too. But she misses mama. And mama misses her. It's a hard time. That's being lonesome for home. And then uh, loneliness is not isolation. You know, you can be lonely in a crowd. You can be lonely in a mall. Say amen right there. I felt that way the other day. I think every dress shop and every department store should be uh, mandated to have chairs somewhere. <laughs> Say amen. How can we text? How can we watch TV on our iPad if we have to stand there the whole time and say, oh yes, honey, that looks really good. Praise God. Yeah, that, that, oh, that'd be perfect for them. Praise the Lord. Yeah, get that thing. Bag it. Let's get out of here. <laughs> they ought to have chairs. They ought to have chairs. I'm going to, I'm going to, I believe they really ought to have, they ought to have a TV room too, amen? <laughs> they ought to have the football game on. But anyway, isolation. You can be in the best church in town and still be lonely. Say so, amen. You can be in the biggest church in town, still be in lonely. You can be in the biggest family in town, still be lonely. There's a lot of folks in big cities that are lonely. They still have single bars. They still have lonely hearts club. They still have chat rooms. You can be in a crowd, so loneliness is not solitude. Let me give you a definition for loneliness. Loneliness is a painful sense of being unwanted. Loneliness is a painful sense of being unneeded, uncared for, may even feel unnecessary. No one seems to care for me, you say, when you're lonely. Nobody seems to want you. Or need you. You know, every person has been created with a need. God put that in Adam's heart and said, It's not good that man should be alone. I'm glad we need each other. I want to say this after many years of pastoring here I need you as a church. And I love our church. I look forward to coming to church. This is not a job, this is a ministry to me. I don't have to be here tonight. I'm not dreading being here. Now, I'm not saying that I'm always uh, excited about being here, but I don't dread being here. Some of y'all come to leave. Some of you already left. But I'll tell you something, friend. Loneliness is saying we need each other. Loneliness is saying nobody needs me. Nobody wants me. Nobody loves me. Nobody understands me. And then uh, number two, uh, there's three basic emotional needs. We have a need for someone to love and someone to love us. Someone we can share with intimately. Number two, we have a need for somebody who understands us, who knows how we feel, who understands us. How many of you men know that your wife understands you? Amen? Your little pouty moods and little sold up time. She understands. And she usually rebukes you when you go into that. Say amen, you mature men. Praise God. So number one, it's uh, you need somebody to love you. God put that need in, in your life. It's under dynamic nature. And then somebody to understand you and still accept you. Isn't it great that somebody knows you but still loves you? Amen. And then third of all, the third thing we desire is somebody who wants us and needs us. We need to be needed. We need someone who says, you are important to me. And folks, I want you to know, Genesis 2.18, God put that need in Adam's life. We need each other, but I want to say most important of all, God put a nature in your life to need God. And you're kidding yourself if you don't think you need God. You need God every hour, every day. Now what causes people to be lonely? This is all introduction. I'll just preach a few minutes. Thank you. Number one, past rejection. Broken marriages. Father who mother or mother who deserted you, walked out on you. I mean left 
and tried to pay, your, pay their way back into your life. And folks, I want you to know maybe you have been hurt so bad that you don't want to try again. That's loneliness. You're definitely not, uh, you, you definitely don't want to be hurt again. I often say this in my marriage retreats. I'm looking forward to March. You better sign up quick because our guest preacher, preachers is Brother Kevin Hall and Sister Corley. She's not going to preach, but she's going to teach. the. We've got another room. We've got two rooms. She's going to teach the ladies. So it's going to be exciting. It's going to be great. And I'm going to teach some. I wasn't going to, but God's laid something on my heart. But I teach in these uh, couples retreats, these marriage retreats, and a lot of people are so distant because they've been hurt so bad, especially if they've had the trauma of divorce in their life, that they put up shells for protection. I'm not going to get hurt again. And so they never let anyone in their life. They have a closed spirit towards each other, and thus there's never a closeness. That's why uh, seven out of ten second marriages do not work. Say so amen right there. Listen, if you're going to get married, make sure it's forever. Come on now, some of you have been through the trauma of divorce. You ought to say amen louder than everybody else and not get offended by it, trying to help the next generation. And so folks, listen, number one reason that a lot of people are lonely is because they want to not get hurt again. Mark Twain said this. I don't read him often, but I do read some. He says, uh, maybe you've been hurt so bad that you don't want to be hurt again. And he said this. If a cat sits on a hot stove, he'll never sit on a hot stove again. As a matter of fact, he won't even sit on a stove when it's a cold one. <laughs> Amen. It looks a lot of times we've been hurt so bad that we choose to be lonely. Number two, some people are lonely because they have basic insecurity. It's called a poor, poor self-image. They don't think they're worthy of friendship. They don't think they're worthy of marriage. And they never accept themselves. And the Bible principle for this, and I'll try to give you a Bible principle for every principle, is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. Turn there with me, please. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28, one of the greatest outlines for marriage and, and marriage uh, manual in the, in the world. It says in Ephesians 5, verse 28, So all men to, have their, to love their wives, even as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth, himself. Amen. I sound like Joel Osteen now, praise God. But listen, verse 29. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it, even as the Lord the church. Folks, I want to tell you this, friend. You need to love yourself. Now, I'm not talking about pride. I'm not talking, look in the mirror and say, I'm God's gift to women or God's gift to men. That's not pride, that's a wild imagination, say amen. But I want to tell you something, you need to accept yourself as God's creation. You need to accept yourself the way God made you. He might have made you where your hair is falling out at 30. I had that experience. It's come back now in my mind. But I will tell you this, listen, listen to me. Folks, listen, you need to accept yourself. And a lot of you are so down on yourself, you won't even talk to the opposite sex. I'm, I'm concerned. I'm telling you this, friend, listen. God help you to realize that as you accept yourself, you can minister and overflow. If you're down on yourself, you're so insecure that you're critical. And critical people are insecure people, and hurt people hurt people. Insecure people hurt people. And folks, I want to tell you something. If you're criticizing everybody else, you're trying to get everybody down on your level. You need to get out of the ditch of insecurity and stop trying to pull everybody else down with you. Amen. Say amen right there. Lonely people can be insecure in themselves. You need to accept yourself and praise God you've got a lot to offer somebody. You're not as bad as you think you are. Your daddy might have beat you down. Your mama might have beat you down. The ex might have beat you down. But I'm going to tell you something. God loves you. God does not make any junk and God wants to use you and God uh, wants to use you to meet other people's needs. Sometimes people are lonely because of basic poor self-image, basic insecurity. They never accept themselves. Husbands, love your wife as you love yourself. 
Then number three, sometimes people who suffer loneliness have suffered much grief. They feel like nobody understands how bad they hurt. And so they isolate themselves. Job did that in Job 19, 13 through 19. Describes a lonely man. He loved God, but he was hurt so bad. He had such grief that it crushed him with sorrow. And he closed himself off in loneliness. Folks, I'll tell you what, the greatest way to get over grief I believe in normal grief. I believe you ought to cry. Say amen. A preacher stood up when my daddy died and me and mother were sitting on the second row and said, you should never cry if you know your loved one's saved. And I thought to myself, I'll cry if I want to. That's a song, isn't it? I'll cry if I want to. Because I want to tell you something, God gives us a pop-off valve just like a hot water heater. It's called tears. Some of you ought to try it. You'll feel a lot better if you cry once in a while. Stop being so prideful that you can't ever shed a tear. Say amen. Some people are so stoic, I'll just keep it inside. And you're just about to die. Well, folks, I want to tell you something. God, Jesus wept. Why can't we? But I want to tell you something. Abnormal grief is when you never get over it. Now, you will never get over losing a loved one. But I want to tell you something. You ought to go on and minister. And I want to tell you the cure for abnormal grief. Worship. Worship. When you worship the God of heaven, you realize there is a heaven. And when you worship the God of heaven, you realize that God is with you even though your husband can never be with you again. Or your wife. Or your child. That there is a heaven. There is a God. And there is a comforter called the Holy Spirit. So worship is the cure for abnormal grief. And some people get in a shell and they just stay at home, and they, do, they continually get depressed, and they're in a bubble of protection because they're crushed with sorrow. Number four, some people are lonely because of self-centeredness. They're wrapped up in themselves. I'm talking about a bubble of pride surrounds their life with self-centeredness. And they're so empty that they feel like they don't need anybody. It's just us two and no more. And folks, I want to tell you something. You need the local church. You need a brother and sister. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but you need a pastor that cares and a pastor's wife that will meet with you. Amen. Some people will never open up because they're so self-centered. They think, I can handle this. No, you can't. You can't handle what the devil tries to put on your plate. I'll tell you what he usually does. He'll handle you and it'll end up being a tragedy. C.S. Lewis said this, to love at all is to be vulnerable. To love anything in your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it, that, your, that is your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one, you say. You wrap it carefully with the hobbies and the little luxuries and avoid all entanglements Look, lock it safe in a casket of your own selfishness. And there it will be broken. It will become unbreakable, unpenetrable, unredeemable. Lonely. Number five, loneliness can be caused by sin. A sinful lifestyle can make you lonely. Sin builds walls, love builds bridges. Amen? Amen? I'm not talking about the wall in Mexico either, or Texas. I'm talking about the wall that surrounds your life. Loneliness. Cain murdered his brother. And listen to what he said in Genesis 6.13. Look at Genesis 6.13. Does anybody need this lesson? Say amen. Look at Genesis. And then listen, if you don't need it, I know somebody that does. You work with them. They're in your family. They'll be coming to your house Christmas Eve. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, the Bible says this, And God said to Noah, The end of the flesh has come upon, upon me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them and the earth. There's a devil out there, there's a roaring lion seeking to devour. And folks, I want you to know that he'll try to isolate, to penetrate your life, 
And the worst scenario in this life is you versus the devil without God and His church. Folks, we need each other. And the world's full of darkness. The world's full of pain. The world's full of agony. And folks, here's a man who's driven away from the presence of God, from his home, from his loved ones, because he sinned. You think sin will make you popular. You think sin will get you a date. You think sin might even get you married. But I want to tell you something, folks. Sin will make you lonely. And one day you'll be lonelier than you've ever been before when sin comes as a payday. You're leaving God and His church out. And so, number six, another reason that people are lonely today is because of the depersonalization of society. I'm just saying we live in a computerized society. Say amen. My mama and daddy used to teach me, look in somebody's eyes when you're talking to them. Now we don't have to, we just thumb it. Amen? We can talk to the whole world without even looking at them. We don't even have to call them. We live in a day of Facebook. That can be dangerous or it can be good, according to how you use it. We can go to the store and don't talk to anybody. We can do self-checkout. Got in trouble the other day and Sam was doing that. That was wonderful. I had to call for assistance like a little kid. Hey, come over here. I think I messed this up. Today we have a car that talks to us. Or a GPS or a Waze. You're about to run out of gas, dummy. You just missed your turn. Ignorant. I mean, they, they talk to you, amen. I was out in uh, Denver, uh, excuse me, uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, and uh, Brother Chris was having, uh, I guess, lonesomeness for the South, and he changed the voice on his GPS to a hillbilly. It was the funniest thing I ever heard in my life. I've been trying to find that ever since I left there. I was, a hillbilly. Hey, you yonder, you missed that corner over there. And I said, boy, I, I can understand that. Amen. That British lady, I can't understand where she's taking me. <laughs> but we're an impersonal society, say amen. Computers and Facebook and chatting and texting. If you had to do that during my message, I hope your phone falls apart. I'm in love now. I'm preaching. Praise God. We don't even know our neighbors. Come on, say amen. My neighbor spoke to me the other day. I was trying to put a down spout on. He says, you having problems? I said, I was born with problems when I try to work on the house. We had a good conversation how not to put up a downspout. No, but listen, a person moves the average of 14 times in a lifetime, especially if you're in a military family. Loneliness, loneliness is a common factor. Number two, loneliness is not only a common factor, it's a crippling force. Emotionally, it's hurtful. It'll drive you crazy. It'll send you into depression, and it can take your life. Loneliness. Spiritually, some even drop out of church when they get lonely. That's the worst thing you could ever do. You ought to get involved in a Sunday school class. You ought to get involved in a master club. You ought to get involved in the bus ministry. You won't be lonely. You won't be lonely long if you get involved in the bus ministry. Say amen. amen. Those kids will come over and see you if they can get, get a ride. Because you're the only parents they know. You're the only one that loves them. You're the only one that cares. You sit at home and drink from the intoxicating cup of self-pity and have the hangover called loneliness. It's emotionally, and spiritually, physically. A lot of people say that 85% of all sickness is caused by bad emotions. There must be a hospital full of emotional wrecks up there, amen, because you can't even get a room. But loneliness... And last but not least, loneliness is a defeated foe. Emmanuel. Which being interpreted is God with us. Let me just say this. Jesus is the ultimate answer to those that feel alone. Jesus has known loneliness for you. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3. Isaiah 53, verse 3. The 
The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him, and he was despised, and we, were, and we esteemed him not. The Bible says he was despised. He was rejected. He was a man of sorrow. He was acquainted with grief. And then it says, we hid our faces from him. His own creation turns his back on him. His own people. The Bible says he came into his own and his own received him not. John 1 verse 11. On the cross he said this in Matthew 27. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was lonely on the cross. But I want to say this. From Jesus knows how you feel. He knows how you feel. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, please. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4, four verse 15. The cure for loneliness. It's a Christmas message. Emmanuel. It says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with our feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Folks, the reason he became lonely is so you'd never have to be lonely. The reason he left the splendor and glory of heaven is so you could go to heaven. The reason he was forsaken is so you won't be forsaken. Thank God the reason he was separated from God by sin is because you can get saved and never be separated. Because look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of what? Grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus, who is our Emmanuel, said in John chapter 15, verse 12, John 15, verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Look at verse 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then verse 14, John 15 says this, You are my friends. You are my friends. If you do whatsoever, I command you. Remember the three basic needs of a human being. Number one, you need somebody, someone to love and to share intimately with you. Jesus loves you. He wants to be intimately involved in your life. Matter of fact, He sends the Holy Spirit to come into your life. You can't get any more intimate than that. He wants to, you to know Him. Number two, we need someone who understands our deepest needs, our wants and our fears. Jesus understands. Psalms 139 says He knows our uprisings, our down. He knows everything about us. And He's the only one that knows everything about us. The fat man with the red outfit does not know all about you. I'll be careful, Mama. I see you looking at me. We need someone who understands. God understands how you feel. I wish the fellow that's isolated at home and won't come to any church would know that God loves them and understands them. Number three, we all have need to have for someone to need us and to want us and desire us. And God has created the church. God has ordained the church. And folks, it's a place where we're needed. Amen? It's a place where we're loved. It's a place where we're accepted. We have all these needs met in Jesus and His church. He understands your pain. He feels your loneliness. He feels the ache and the void. He knows, but praise God, He cares what you're at, where you're at right now. And to you, Jesus, you're more than a number in a Sunday school class. Amen. Heard some Sunday school teachers all excited and cooked a hundred pizzas this morning and got gifts for every child and one child showed up. One child. If y'all have called me, I'd have come up there and ate that pizza, I promise you. I'd have ate whether I was hungry or not. But I want to tell you something. Their reward is they love those children. And that's their family. 
And that's their ministry. And folks, I want to tell you something. If you don't feel needed, it's because you hadn't tried to meet some needs. You don't feel like you've got a friend. I'm going to tell you why you don't have a friend. You must show yourself friendly. Say amen. They'll line up at your door if you'll just care. And just love them and express it. They'll line up at your door. Whew. Let me just say this. Jesus desires you. He says, come to me, all you the heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Rest for what? Your soul. Learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly. Come unto me and I'll give you rest for your soul. How many's heavy laden or ever been heavy laden? Raise your hand. Say amen. Rest of you come to the altar for passing out while I'm preaching. And this ain't one of these flamboyant, rough, loud messages. It's some of on my heart. Folks, being Jesus' friends will elevate you. Not being holier than thou or better than thou, but just you know that you're living for thou. Folks, there's an elevation of life when you live for God's glory and His fellowship and His approval and His companionship. There's another level of life. It's called peace. You live for Him, not for them. And you live for Him and not yourself. Then it enlarges you. Not only does it elevate you, but it enlarges you. What am I saying? I got some friends in South Africa. That blows my mind. They write me all the time. They text me. They Facebook me. I can't even pronounce their names. Sillalobo, Balobolo, Lalabo, Lababalo. I don't know what his name is, but I'm his friend. He's my friend. He has a problem. He'll write me about it. I, I, I post something on Facebook and he says, like. I said, man, old little Bolo likes that. Amen. He rejoices in things happening in the church. He rejoices over souls being saved and bus routes being built. He's my friend. I have friends in South America. I have friends in Canada. I have friends in England. I have friends in Middle East. Listen, friend, I'm a hillbilly from Grace in Georgia, and I have friends all around the world. I got family members all around the world. I'm telling you, friend, when you get involved in God's work, it touches the world. And the world touches you. And you can bear burdens like the Tolson family's burdens and feel part of them and adopt them, as I preached on this morning or taught on. Every friend of Jesus is a friend of mine. And every enemy of Jesus is an enemy of mine. He elevates you, he enlarges you, and then he enriches you. I want you to look at Luke chapter 10 in closing, verse 23 and 24, and I'll try to close. My time's up. Luke chapter 20, excuse me, Luke chapter 10. Wonderful chapter. And I want you to look at uh, verse 23 and 24. It says, he turned him into his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. You know, we've seen some miracles this past year. We've seen some souls pass from death into life. We've seen some souls get saved. But look at this. Verse 24 says, For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, have not heard them. Angels would love to sing Amazing Grace, but they can't sing it. And folks, prophets and kings would love to be in your ministry and touch the lives you've touched and be a friend to Jesus and be close to Him because, praise God, John 14 says that we have a comforter. And the word comforter in the Greek is Paraclete, which means one that comes alongside. You are never, you are never, you are never alone when the Spirit of God's in your life. He's the comforter. So if you're lonely, here it is, Emmanuel. God with us. If you're alone, others. Friendly. Family. 
I'll just be honest with you. I don't know how anybody, proper English, anyone, could go through life without a church family. Boy, they're missing it. There ain't no club. There's no team. I used to be big in sports. There's no team that's close to like the family of God. Say amen. When I broke my leg my junior year, uh, they wouldn't even wave at me in the hall because I couldn't contribute to their trophies. I couldn't be their captain. And I found out who my real friends were. There was one guy that came along and uh, helped me carry my books to class when I was on a long leg cast and crutches. They just roped me off. There ain't no team like this team. There ain't no family like the family of God. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to say it real, real kind, real, real straight. There is no organization on this earth better than being a part of God's church. Amen. You try to find satisfaction and acceptance and friendship and love, and you try, hey, 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 call your buddies when somebody dies and see how, 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 how many come. But you call a Christian friend. They'll sit up with you all night. They'll stay at the funeral home. They'll do anything they can for you. Folks, the illustration is this. The greatest joy of Christmas is Emmanuel. God's with you because God came to you when you couldn't come to him. And he even died for you and took your place feel like singing a song, but I won't sing it. I'm just going to quote the words. Hayden will sing it Tuesday night. But in the, On the German front, a group of German soldiers began to sing Stelz Nace. In German, it means silent night. And on the American side, they started singing silent night. And a few troops emerged from the trenches into no man's land in between. And when, they were, and, and when they weren't gunned down, others followed. And then the men reportedly sang more carols and shook hands and exchanged gifts on Christmas Day, World War I, on the German front. It's told, a British soldier told the story, said about 10 o'clock that morning, I was peeping over the edge of my foxhole and I saw a German. He was waving his arms. And presently two of them got out of their trench and came towards ours. We were just about to fire on them when we saw that he had no rifle. So, no one of, so not one of our men went to meet. So one of our men got out of the trench and went and met him. About two minutes, the ground between the two lines of trenches were swarming with men and officers of both sides, shaking hands and wishing each other a happy Christmas. And folks, there was a Christmas truce that day that even included a soccer game played in the space between the trenches, though, horse, though, through, though historians haven't been able to verify whether it happened or not because the ground was probably was it flat enough for a decent soccer game as an organized soccer match would likely have been shut down by the senior officials. But at a minimum, it seemed that someone produced a soccer ball and the men began to kick it around. And they sang together, silent night, holy night. All is calm, all is bright. Round young virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Silent night, holy night, son of God, love's pure light. Radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord at thy birth. Jesus, Lord at thy birth to be heard through the airs of the trenches of World War I. Now, folks, let me just say this, and I'll close. 
What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Miss Elsie wrote this poem, Life is better when we walk with the Lord. Life is better when we walk with the Lord. The sun seems so much brighter and our burdens are lighter. God's Word has an answer for our every need. God is glorified when we let the Holy Spirit in our lives lead. Life is better when we walk with the Lord. Life is better when we walk with the Lord, living by faith and doing God's will. Remember, Jesus gave His life upon Golgotha's hill. Being a faithful servant, obedient to His call, submit to God our very all. Life is better when we walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank You. As I read that poem, I remember what a good friend Miss Elsie was to my family. What a friendship, what a family we have in Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that I help someone that's tempted to isolate themselves this coming year and leave the local church, leave the family of God. And Lord, maybe, just maybe, this message will be remembered as the cure for loneliness is your name, Emmanuel, because truly, Lord, you are with us. And you love us, you care for us, you understand us, and you even use us for your redounding glory. What a friend we have in Jesus. Lord, I pray for those that are home that are lonely in grief, lonely in, 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 in bitterness, Pray for those, dear God, that are lonely in sin. They're in the jail tonight. They're in the jail of addiction tonight. They're in the jail of loneliness. Their family's falling apart. Their children have lost respect. Lord, I pray for those children that are wayward, that are in the lonely prodigal pig pen. They're trying to find the group, and they're trying to find the gang, and they're trying to find the group all in the wrong places. When all they need to do is find you. God, I pray for them. And I pray, dear God, we'd be a friend to them. Not a friendly sinner, but as you were a friend to sinners. God, help us. God, help us to be a friend. But God, help us to realize you're the best friend we'll ever have. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I know this has been an unusual message. I'm so glad I preached it tonight, not this morning. But have me to say, preacher, I know where you're coming from because I have been lonely in my life. But I also have known some people that have been very lonely and their life is a tragedy. And my heart goes out to them tonight. And I want you to pray that God would use me to minister to their hearts and be a true friend. And that's our prayer tonight. Would you lift your hand up if you need that tonight? I want to be a friend, don't you? I want to be a good, I want to good be a good family member. I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a good shepherd. I want to, I just want to be a good member of Whitfield Baptist Church. I want to come to minister and not just be ministered to. I want to come to give my life to others. And not think that God ought to serve me on some silver platter. Lord, thank you. Thank you, dear God, for what you did in hearts this morning. But thank you, dear God, for what you're doing in hearts tonight. God, help us. God, help those that are lonely. God, help them to realize your presence is precious. Lord, I pray that you'd send somebody in their lives. I pray, dear God, that you'd meet their needs and their need of feeling loved and being wanted and being understood and having someone alongside of them. Lord, you're able. But Lord, I pray that most important of all, God, that we'd never succumb to the devil who wants to isolate, who wants to insulate us from the things of God 
as we grope in this world for acceptance. We're going to praise you and thank you for using this simple message. In Jesus' name, amen.